Howdy, CI this week. I am the Mad Conservative Crime Fighter, and today we're in a new set and following the pattern of episode naming. We'll call this one the Crimey Nation. These are some of the stories we are following. Deathmatch Wrestling, which I referred to as Ultra Hardcore Wrestling, recently made a big impression in the state of Indiana. So much so that the Floyd County Health Department issued a warning to get tested for hepatitis C and HIV. And other area promoters are calling for the re-regulation of pro wrestling in the state. Some background. An ultra hardcore match that they call deathmatch wrestling, to differ from a mere hardcore match, tends to be bloody, brutal, and the most severe, with a heavy emphasis on the use of heavy bleeding and the usage of fluorescent light tubes, light bulbs, planes of glass, barbed wire, sometimes electrified, when tied around the ring, fire, thumbtacks, razor blades, gusset plates, syringes, explosives, bits of nails, bits of barbed wire, staple guns, concrete blocks, live piranhas, cactus plants, and other live scorpions, and other dangerous wrestling weapons, along with graphic violence to induce extreme and heavy bleeding and will typically lead to bloodier, more brutal, and more violent contests. The types of foreign objects and the nature of the foreign objects used so as to be extremely graphic, brutal, dangerous, bloody, and violent in nature. In more recent years, some state-led commissions in the U.S. have cracked down on the types and frequency of weapons used in these matches. A Japanese promotion called Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling established this concept, and of course, McFoley made himself a bigger stir, following this infamous battle with Terry Funk, setting up the Hell in the Cell match against Undertaker years later. So the callous came when a newer promotion called Pro Wrestling Trainwreck held an event in New Albany, Indiana on June the 23rd. One of the men who participated in the event Dakota Bostock ended up in the emergency room where he received internal stitches and 40 staples to close wounds all over his body. During the match, Bostock dove into a shopping cart full of light tubes and was powerbombed through a table of glass panes. According to a Facebook post by 3G Eric Wayne, he tried to refuse going to the hospital but went on his order. Officials at the hospital were shocked by what they saw and heard. Reaction came in from the co-owner of Ohio Valley Wrestling, Chad Miller, who blasted the organization, accusing them of devaluing what they and other promoters are trying to accomplish. Floyd County Health Department warning also caused repercussions for OVW, as one wrestler booked for their event participated in the train wreck show. Miller had to inform that person and the person they practiced and competed against that they could have have had exposure to a blood-borne pathogen. As you know, contracting HIV, which causes the AIDS virus, is a career-ending medical condition. The whole ordeal, he contends, makes the entire industry look bad, and Indiana legislators need to step up and do something. Miller, incidentally, was a former chairman of the Kentucky Boxing and Wrestling Commission. Indiana is not a regulated state. The father of Dakota, Sean Bostick, expressed shock and disbelief when he watched his son's match on video. He wants his son to excel but not die in the process and sees what they are doing as irreparable harm under the guise of you're going to be a superstar. Through Jarek Wayne, following this match, declared Dakota a superstar now. Dakota Bostock, for his part, made the decision himself to do the match. He was not pressured to do so. In the aftermath for Trainwreck, the promotion was booted out of the state where they had to relocate future events to Memphis, Tennessee. The promoter ID'd himself as John Glenn, but a short time later it was learned that this person was John Calvin the son of infamous IWA Mid-South promoter Ian Rotten. It was at that point that it started to make some sense as to why the County Health Department became involved 
It just so happens that Ian Rotten held a similar tournament in the city 22 years ago. Rotten had been banned for life from promoting and wrestling in Kentucky, which is why he currently promotes on the north side of the Ohio, Ohio River in the Louisville area. Like father, like son, I guess. Kentucky incidentally had loosened regulations on pro wrestling under a bill signed by Governor Matt Piven back in 2016. Jim Cornette laid the blame squarely on Ian Rotten for a rule being put on the books where the, if a match, where a match had to be stopped immediately if someone bleeds. That rule kept WWE, boxing, and UFC from doing TV or pay-per-view events in the state. John Calvin, for his part, states all of his talent are tested and tested frequently for hepatitis C or HIV. He blasted the media reporting as sensationalized in an attempt to scare anyone who reads it. He thanks everyone for continued support, and those who no longer support them, they don't need them anyway. Wrestlers who participated in the event blasted the Floyd County Health Department for issuing the health warning. Meanwhile, Resistance Pro Wrestling held a weekend of ultra hardcore tournaments in Chicago the July 13th weekend. Game Changer Wrestling, who went through, went through Chicago recently, also held such a card on July the 4th. Though neither drew the headlines, Trainwreck did. Game Changer, though, got criticized for sending the wrong message by holding an event literally in someone's backyard. Deathmatch wrestling is very much something not for everyone, though it is extremely popular with a niche base of fans. I have never gotten the allure of this type of wrestling, though I'm not a fan of slasher movies either. I was asked if I'd film such an event one time, but turned that down. While I can tolerate an ultra-hardcore match here and there, I don't have the stomach to witness an entire card of them. I did ask a few wrestlers who participated in it what the allure was to them. One said she did them because she had fully learned how to express herself in the ring without doing crazy spots while in the process of training. Another claimed she thought it was fun in general, as weird as that sounds. They thought it was a way to stand out, break stereotypes, and that women could do what the men could. A gentleman who did the death matches back in the day did these matches for the pure adrenaline rush as if it were a drug. And he didn't really feel the cuts, the burns, or the heavy hits until hours later. Others say they are drawn to this type of wrestling as it is said to give opportunities they wouldn't get as a straight up wrestler. Sarah Logan, who is in WWE now, got booking offers from promotions in multiple foreign countries due to her involvement in deathmatch wrestling. And we all know the former Dean Ambrose, John Moxley, got considerable attention for his involvement in deathmatch wrestling. Supposedly the paydays are bigger, but that assumes that the medical bills are covered. I don't know what percentage of people who do this style of wrestling get signed by WWE, Impact, ROH, or how many All Elite Wrestling will sign from that group, and I cannot say it's a large number. I don't believe there's much new ground left to break in this style of wrestling. Now a flashback. Nine years ago this month saw the passing of Joseph Carl Bailey Jr better known as J.C. Bailey. His father, Joseph Bailey Sr., confronted and insinuated Ian Rodden contributed to his eventual death when he gave him some sort of medication that is only available with a prescription to cope with pain resulting from injuries following J.C.'s win of the King of the Death Match Tournament in Peoria, Illinois during June 2010. This angered many as J.C. had been a past drug abuser. The revelations came out in an infamous interview that Jerry Wiseman conducted with Ian Rott. To be fair, J.C. Bailey participated in two other ultra-hardcore tournaments within a span of 45 days. J.C. Bailey dying to sleep from brain aneurysm a week after his 27th birthday in August 2010. 
the result of multiple concussions and traumas to the brain from the style of wrestling he did. His brain was donated to medical researchers at Boston University. Bailey Sr. barred Rotten from his son's funeral. Bailey Sr. passed away in 2013. On a somewhat related note, the state of Louisiana attempted to take steps to deregulate pro wrestling where the House Commerce Commission approved House Bill 405 back in April under lobbying efforts by WWE. The full House, however, after debate, voted down the bill 35 to 60. Eleven states, including Illinois, do not regulate pro wrestling. Other states have moved regulation from under a select board to various insurance or licensing boards. Coming up, promoters want to ban fans for saying mean things. An update on the canceled RWF event and for your mail. You're watching PWCI This Week. As drivers, we make a million little choices each and every time we get behind the wheel. Choices like distracted driving, DUI, speeding, and no seatbelt are proven killers. But there's another threat lurking on your roadways that you need to consider. It's the choice by drivers to ignore the move-over law. This lethal choice has led to the death of first responders from all over the state. Men and women sworn to serve and protect you, the people of Illinois. Slow down. Move over. It's the law. A sad announcement came down from Dymo Pro Wrestling. Keong Option, real name Brian Like, passed away on July the 15th. He was only 30 years old. The circumstances of his passing from information that I was able to find posted by one of his friends is that on Sunday, July the 14th, while in the midst of his recurring Army Reserve physical training in Columbia, Missouri, he suffered a heat stroke. He was laid to rest last Wednesday, where a celebration of life was held in Florissant, Missouri, and was heavily attended. Option wrestled between St. Louis and Kansas City, and once held the Dymo Pro Wrestling Tag Titles with Justin Dier. He was also a candidate for the Missouri House of Representatives in 2016. Harley Race has been hospitalized somewhere in the Tennessee while traveling to a fan convention in Knoxville where he had a medical issue developed that needed addressed quickly. He has canceled all upcoming appearances and has yet to return home to the St. Louis area. While his condition has improved some, he is now out of the woods where he can travel. WLW has not revealed what he's dealing with currently, but he has been under long-term treatment for lung cancer. Get well soon, Harley. An editorial comment 
on the rebellious wrestling federation drama, which still continues as Sean Hubbard broke a silence on June the 19th, addressing what went down on June the 1st. First thing I want to mention, wrestling talent have a responsibility to check the credentials of the promoter before accepting a booking from them. If you learn something about the promoter that causes you doubt, but you've already accepted the booking, you should either write it out or find a suitable substitute. I can understand those who are fairly new to the business not knowing all the local wrestling lore. However, if you've been active 10 years in the area, that's pretty careless not to do your homework. Secondly, I feel that certain people overreached when they made themselves vulnerable to legal action in civil court. It would have been far better if you had refused to do business with the party. Instead, this just gave them ammunition to use against you. Of course, that depends on the lawsuit and the targeting the correct parties involved with the physical evidence you have. Following the suit is crucial, considering the case is provable and the losses are substantial. Those losses have held up following the suit as, as refunds have to be covered first, and that has been slow. That said, at this point, even if successful in winning a damage award, I do not see how Hubbard can run an event in the state of Illinois ever again. Not many people trust Hubbard. The number reduced even further after this escapade. And Hubbard cannot realistically trust anyone either. In trying to get this event off the ground, he had originally partnered with former WWE wrestler Mo of Men on a Mission, but for some reason, ties were cut. There were roster problems where he had a very large percentage of who had booked originally had to be replaced because they all pulled out. The fact that Hubbard is fully engaged in a bitter feud and has extreme heat with so many people for a whole host of reasons makes it nearly impossible. While most of his problems can be traced back to 2012 with the ill-fated Combat for a Cure, where many still not do not believe he has sustained a sufficient enough penalty or should be blackballed from the business for life, comments on his weekly podcast over the years dump more fuel to the fire to which you've heard on this very program in a guest commentary that legal action may be taken against him. May of his critics populate what is left of what is ChicagoProWrestling.com. Many years ago, it was a place to talk wrestling in the Midwest. Now the place is a mere shell of its heyday as the owner of the site allowed the trolls to overthrow and drive off, drive off most of its readers. They've let out a number of charges and observations about Hubbard. Not all, but some are accurate, and some are over the top and greatly exaggerated. Because of Hubbard's past problems, these claims would still maintain significant levels of verisimilitude due to the difference in perceived credibility. For example, they claimed he kept the advance ticket money to get himself a new smartphone. They offered no, no evidence to support that claim, nor explain why so much time and money was spent on promoting the event if that was the intention all along. There's also the issue of Hubbard acting like he knows better and lecturing everyone on how to promote while not having the track record to back up his words. This while charging that certain individuals act as if they're better than everybody else in wrestling. Now, I believe he conducts himself this way for one simple reason. He is held to a much higher standard and thinks it's very unfair to be repeatedly raked over the coals for issues other promoters get little or no scrutiny for, thus steps in to aggressively enforce the same standards he is held to. If you listen to his program for any length of time, you know he has well articulated the do's and don'ts of promoting. Implementation has been another matter. The only question is, if he wasn't clashing with so many people in the present, would he be able to execute? Hence, why it's time to go elsewhere. There's been chatter about slurs uttered against the LGBT party at wrestling events. All Elite Wrestling 
and more recently, Kaju Attack Wrestling, to which promoters are talking about banning anyone or going so far as boycotting entire cities who shout them at one of their events. It's supposedly to protect the thin-skinned wrestlers in the ring from any butthurt. This includes adults-only events where fans can fire F-bombs left and right and are under the influence of adult beverages. Let me say this to promoters and wrestlers who are wanting to start ejecting and banning people left and right. I'm not going to condone the language nor go uttering it myself. But to put things into perspective, I have been called a ton of nasty names and slurs over my lifetime. Even the hosts of a couple of other wrestling talk shows did it to me live on their programs. And not a single person gave a rat's rump about my feelings. And I'm dead certain your high school locker rooms spewed nasty language daily without batting an eye. And I'm certain nobody got expelled for it. Anyone who claims they have never heard anything of the sort uttered in their high school locker rooms are in denial because they are lying to themselves. And I can remember many a times where I could hear chants broadcast on television at wrestling events where they said the six letter F word at somebody. So why should someone live a sheltered life from the slightest hint of butthurt? If you banished everyone who said something mean to St. Helena or Tristan da Cuna, those islands would sink deep into the ocean to the way the people dump there. And about half of the population of this country would be wiped out. This is a snowflake culture that's been allowed to develop by helicopter parenting and it hasn't done anything to improve conditions for anyone. Grow thick skin. I had to. Why can't you do it? The world does not care about your feelings. That's reality and nothing you do will ever change that. You're wasting your time. You may find some individuals that will tell you they care, but they are just as powerless as you are. The St. Louis Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame has announced its next inductee, and it will be Bob Orton Sr., the father of Bob Orton Jr., and the grandfather of Randy Orton. The date of the induction ceremony has yet to be announced. And late word coming in that Debbie Combs will also be inducted into the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame. The ceremonies will be held at the South Broadway Athletic Club on Saturday, September the 14th at Mid-Missouri Wrestling Alliance, the home of the Hall of Fame. Now to answer a viewer mail. A viewer posted a comment where he said the ref in the first match was pretty good and you buried him. Never call him out while you stand at ringside. This is what he's talking about. <laughs> Your winner of the match, Alex hey. Angel! Hey, Raph! You had the tight! Of course he didn't! Rookie Raph! So I am pointing out that the ref missed a bit of cheating, where the loser of the match and the victim of the cheating and the crowd were all shouting at the referee. But I am accused of burying him, and I'm considered the worst, because I did it also. And then I ruin most shows. I attend. Let me show you what an actual bearing of a ref looks like. And for the full illustration, the YouTube airing of this broadcast, all the cursing is not all censored. <laughs> 
semantics. I don't agree with the claim that I buried the rookie ref at Proving Ground. Now very often I'm actually defending the referee during matches where various members of the audience argue with the ref about whether it was a three count or not and I'm holding up two fingers and telling them it wasn't a pin. So let's just pull the audience and see what they think. For the YouTube audience, click the link below in the description. Do you believe I buried referee Chiffon Smith after that missed call. Vote yes if you think I did. Vote no if you don't believe it was a burial. We'll have a snapshot of the results in a couple weeks. And now that for this edition of PWCI This Week. Be sure to support your local independent wrestling promotion wherever it is. It is the summer months and things are quite slowed down, but things are going to get crazy in a hurry come September. Be sure to look up your wrestling, local wrestling event by following the St. Louis Wrestling Community at stlwrestling.livejournal.com and we'll have all of the current schedule information posted. Until next time, I'm the Mad Conservative Crime Fighter. You can watch the current episode of PWCI this week by bookmarking the link below tiny.cc slash P-W-C-I. Until next time, the spin is making me dizzy. <laughs>